Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And we will be looking at verses 73 through 80. Psalm 119, 73 through 80. I'm going to say something to get us started that's going to sound like I'm setting the bar impossibly high. <clears throat> and that is that God calls us to have a blameless heart. A blameless heart. That's our goal. That's what we're aiming toward. That's, it's not, listen, it's not sinless perfection. But it is having a heart that is open before God and allowing God to point out the things in our heart that are not in line with His Word and with His will. Psalm 119, verses 73 through 80. And if you're able, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? Yod, your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. O may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your servant. May your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie. But I shall meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. And may my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I will not be ashamed. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this evening. And we ask, O oh God, that as you illumine the heart and mind of the psalmist, that you would illumine our hearts and minds this evening as well. God, we love you so much, and we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. In and through the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Master, Amen. You may be seated. You know, there's a hymn that, that we love to sing, and it expresses our, our, our desire. And that hymn is, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I must tell Jesus Everything that's going on in my life because I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Beloved, that's what the psalmist has been saying throughout this psalm. I have to take this to God. I have to take all of this to God. I am going through a time. There are burdens in my life. I am being persecuted uh, unfairly. I am being treated uh, as though, you know, there was something wrong with me. I've got things going on in my life. I have a heavy trial. And no one around me even seems to care. I must go to God with this burden. Because God is the only one. And we're going to see as we work through this. This is a pretty amazing section of Psalm 119 and what the, uh, the, psalm, uh, the psalmist is saying. See, have you ever noticed that sometimes just our very presence makes a lot of people angry? They call us names like Goody Two Shoes, or they might call us a, a Bible Thumper, or they might call us a, a Fundy, saying that we're a, a fundamentalist. And, you know, if they call me that, I say, well, thank you for noticing. 
All right. Thank you for noticing that, that I take the Word of God very seriously. But, you know, there are people. There are people that our mere presence just flies all over their nerves because they know that we're trying to do what the psalmist says here, may my heart be blameless in your statutes. We're not all up in their face. We're just trying to live our lives the way that God has called us to live our lives in His Word. And they look at that, and they know that their life isn't anywhere close to that. And it bothers them. And so all they can do, listen to me, beloved. This is what our political season is all about. They go to what we call in logic an ad hominem attack. And an ad hominem attack is when I don't really want to invest the time or the energy to try to show why your position is wrong, so I'm just going to attack you. And so, but with the belief that if I can attack you and make you look bad, then I don't really have to deal with whatever your position is. I, I, I just kind of get you out of my way, out of my sight, out of my mind, and the problem is gone. Well, the problem's not gone. You know that. The problem's still there, you know. I can't tell you how many times we had a man, I've told you about him in the past, Brother Roy, in, in my squadron when I was in the Marine Corps. And, and Roy was a man that was on fire for God. Larry was not. And Roy took a lot of grief. You can imagine in a Marine Corps squadron of young men what kind of, of, of things people are going to say about Brother Roy. And when it began happening, you know, I'd just walk away. I wouldn't stand up for Roy. I didn't want to be in the middle of it. And I just kind of thought that if I walk away and get away from here, that all of this will go away. It didn't. And, you know, I, I, I wish I could find Brother Roy today. And, and, and first I'd apologize to him. I'd say, brother, when, when I watched people treat you the way that, that they did, I didn't say a word. But, brother, I want you to know that watching you, and, and listen, that's what we're talking about tonight, watching how you responded to these men, <laughs> God used that in my life a few years later. Okay? Okay? And, 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 and God used your faithfulness to him to begin his work in my life. And I just want to thank you for that, Brother Soroy, if you're watching tonight. Okay? I, I have no notion that you would be, but if you are, Brother, thank you for what you did. And thank you for the way that you lived your life. Anyway, these people are coming after the psalmist. And, and they're making accusations against him. And where do you think Roy ran where all that, when all that stuff started? Well, he didn't come to my room. He got alone in his room. And he got alone with God. And he said, God, may your compassion come to me that I may live. For your law is my delight. And see, that's what the psalmist is doing in this message. He, he, he's saying, God, you're my only refuge. You're the only place that I can turn. And that's what God calls us to do when we need his comfort. We're looking tonight at the 10th section of Psalm 119. And as you see in your Bibles, it is... Uh, it, it, it uses the letter Yod. Many of y'all may be familiar with the letter Yod from something that Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I say to you that not one jot or one tittle will pass away until the law be fulfilled. 
He said Yod. Yod is the smallest Hebrew letter. And in fact, in, if, if you were writing it in English, I can, I can tell you, you already know how to write one Hebrew letter, and that's Yod, just make an apostrophe. Okay? That's all it is. It's just a little apostrophe at the very top of the line. Every verse, every section or every line in this stanza, as we've seen from all of the others, begins with the letter Yod. This psalm takes us back to one of the first truths of the Christian faith in life. It calls us to remember some very basic things, some things that we have known from the moment that we began our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to relearn those things. We need to be reminded of them from time to time. We need to draw more comfort and encouragement and strength from these principles. It calls us to go back to those first principles. And we're going to look at the first one in just a moment. But what the psalmist is telling us is that God calls us to trust in Him in all things, in all things, beloved, and to be blameless. Verse 73. Verse 73. First truth. Your hands made me and fashioned me. In the church traditions that use a catechism to prepare their children for baptism, the catechismal formula will usually have questions. It's in a question and answer format. And one of, if not the first questions that will be asked in that catechism is, who made you? And, of course, the answer to that is, God made me. And then the follow-up question is, why did God make you? And the answer to that question is, is to glorify God forever. Very simple. Listen, beloved. If our answer to where we came from is not verse 73a, we have no hope of getting any other part of the Bible right. If we believe that we came from somewhere other than the direct intervention of God, the direct creation of God, then none of the rest of the Bible is going to make sense. In fact, most of what Jesus said makes no sense if this is not true. You, your hands, and listen, listen to me. You know, it's one thing to make this kind of a general principle, right? That God created humanity. Or that God created Adam and Eve directly, okay? I mean, you know, there's nobody in this room that would not affirm that God directly created, that he fashioned Adam out of the dust of the earth, and that he fashioned Eve out of something, a bone, a rib, or something that he took out of Adam's side. We don't have a problem with that. But the problem with looking at it just that way is that it's not personal. Your hands made me. Your hands made me. Do you understand all the difference that that makes? You are not an accident, beloved. You are not just the product of biology. God made you. And we're going to look in just a moment at some other verses from, uh, from another psalm. And then also, you know, we're going to end up in, 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 in uh, Jeremiah 1, 5. But, but we'll get there in a moment. See, so much, so much of the Christian life is wrapped up in your hands made me and fashioned me. See, 
If God made me, if God fashioned me, then that gives him the right to direct the steps of my life. That gives him the authority to say what I can and what I cannot do. And I got to tell you, beloved, we would be absolutely on fire for the gospel if we would understand God made me and fashioned me. Now, why is that important? In verse 75, we see that the, that the psalmist is in affliction again, and in that faithfulness, you have afflicted me. This is the third stanza in a row that the psalmist has brought up the fact that he is being afflicted. And when he reflects, listen to me, beloved, he, when he reflects on that truth that I am afflicted, Where does he go for comfort? He goes right back to the first truth. Your hands made me and fashioned me. Does all of a sudden, all of your life suddenly make sense? If we will get our minds wrapped around, your hands made me and fashioned me. You made me who I am. You didn't do this to harm me. You didn't do this to hurt me. You did this because you're good and because you love me. And so he goes right back to that first truth. God made me. God is God made everything that is. And he made me. And if he made me, listen to me, he made me for this hour of affliction too. And he will see me through. The psalmist confessed that he was the product of God's Careful, loving hands. And again, it's personal. It's not just that God created humanity and then trusted biology to do the rest of it. The psalmist is saying, you made me individually. You were involved. Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book, listen to this, and in your book, were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. You understand? God already knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow morning. Maybe you got a doctor's appointment this week. God already knows what the doctor's going to say to you. God already knows all of that stuff. And in his book, all of those days were written. They were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time delving into the intricacies of of foreknowledge and predestination and free will and whether this means that you don't really have any choice in what's going to go on in your life. You can talk to me about that later if you want to. But what I want you to understand is that whatever is happening in our lives right now, whatever is going to start happening in our lives tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, every single one of them were all written, and the days were ordained for us when as yet there was not one of them. God knows. God cares. God already has a plan in place. Whatever is happening in your life is not an accident. It is not happenstance. It is not karma. It is ordained. Jeremiah 1.5 puts it this way. 
before I formed you. This is from the mouth of God. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have past tense. It's already done. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. God was involved in the call of Jeremiah before Jeremiah was even formed. And so because God had so carefully crafted his servant with such thoughtful detail, God knew exactly what his servant needed. Listen to me, beloved. When he needed it. Not when he thought he needed it, but when he needed it exactly. And so with that in mind, the psalmist then returns and confesses his need to understand. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. You know, what would you have prayed if you were in affliction? Lord, give me understanding. Help me understand why I'm having to go through this. What did I do to make you mad that I'm having to go through this? God, help me to understand this affliction. That's not what the psalmist prays. He says, give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Why? Verse 74. May those who fear you see me and be glad. Okay, now wait. That sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? <laughs> that sounds like we're going, woo, woo, I'm so glad that God is wearing that boy out and leaving me alone. <laughs> okay? Or, you know, that we go to him and we have that notion. Remember when the blind man was brought to Jesus? What was their first question? Who sinned? Whose fault is this? Who sinned that caused this boy to be born blind? No, what the psalmist is saying is that, God, I am going through the midst of this affliction. I am going through a rough patch in my life right now. God, would you give me your understanding that I may learn your commandments. And the reason that I want to learn your commandments is so that I can walk in a way that is blameless. We'll see in verse 80 in your statutes. I want to walk in a way that I will not be ashamed. Verse 80, I want to walk in a way that when other people look at me and they know full well what I'm going through, they can say God is good. God is is with him in the midst of this affliction. And so what he wants to do, oh my goodness, it's 77 degrees in here, beloved. I thought it was just me. Is it not working? All right. Just getting us ready. <laughs> what he is saying, beloved, is that God, since I'm going through this, would you use my life to teach others how to go through the same thing? Man, that's a hard prayer to pray, isn't it? That's a hard prayer to pray. God, would you use my affliction to teach others? See, We've already seen in verses 67 and 71 that he had confessed that he needed God's help to help him make a strong testimony so that others might be blessed through him. And he's praying that as they watched him that they would be encouraged by seeing his sustaining power for life's fiercest trials. You see, beloved, the key to the psalmist's hope I mean, I've tried to keep that in front of us throughout all of these messages because the title of all of these messages has been something where? In God's Word. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Where is he going to learn them? 
from the Word of God. He's saying, I want to be blameless, verse 80, in your statutes. He's going to learn those from the Word of God. And he's telling us that the Word of God is our key. Verse 75. Again, God did not necessarily, I mean, he says in verse uh, 75, uh, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. This is not one of those things where God up in heaven said, hey, y'all, watch this. This is one of those things where God allowed these people to afflict the psalmist. And the psalmist knows that, and he knows that God is going to bring something good out of it. But listen to me, listen. He knows, back in verses 36 and 37, that God is at least partially dealing with a sin that this man hasn't gained victory over yet, and that is covetousness. And so we saw when we were back in verses 36 and 37 that he asked God to cause him to deal with that, un, I guess, unresolved sin in his own life. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. Oh, and God, please, revive me in your ways. Revive me in your ways, he says. Because, listen to me, beloved, he knows that when those things are taken out of his life, that if he turns his eyes away from looking at vanity, well, guess what? Unless he fixes his eyes on something else, vanity is still in his eyes. Even though the vanity may be back there, if he does this, if something else is not filling his mind, then vanity is still filling his mind. And so the psalmist says, revive me in your ways. God, take this junk, take this sin out of my life and revive me in your ways. Fill me with your ways. Fill that void with that. You see, beloved... He understood that God disciplines His children in faithfulness to us. He corrects us because He loves us and wants us to be free from the crippling consequences of sin. Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 10. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. Verse 10. For they, that's our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. That's some stuff right there, beloved. That's some stuff. That's how we get to verse 80, okay? That's how we get to the point where we're walking blameless before God. It's how we get to the point where God is real in our lives. And when we recognize that He is doing what He is doing for our good so that we may share His holiness. Verse 76. He says, Oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your servant. Wow. You understand? You understand what he's done again in verse 76? It's the same thing he did in verse 73. It's personal. This is not some abstract concept to him. Oh, may your loving kindness comfort your children. No. Comfort me. God, I am hurting. I need your loving kindness to comfort me. According to your word, according to the promises that you have made in your word to me. This is something personal to him. It is not a general word to humanity, but it is something 
personal to the psalmist himself. Beloved, God will comfort you personally in your trials. Go to him and ask for that comfort in his promises. Verse 77. God ask. No, I'm not. Just a minute. Let me wipe my eyes so I can see. Do I now? Yeah. I'm, yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> Y'all won't church me for taking my jacket off, will you? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 77. May your compassion come to me that I may live. For your law is my delight. That word compassion is a word that comes from the same word, the same Hebrew word that means womb. And so what the psalmist is saying, God, I need you to envelop me in your life-giving presence as I was enveloped in my mother's womb. May that compassion, may that same love, may that same care Come to me that I may live because your law is my delight. I want to live the life that you have called me to live. Verse 78. Throughout this psalm, the psalmist has referred to these men as arrogant and proud. And he says, may the arrogant be ashamed because they subvert me with a lie. Let me ask you a question. Somebody gets on Facebook tonight and starts, starts talking smack about you. What are you going to do? You're going to smack right back, aren't you? Most of us, that's our response. We're going to talk smack right back. Oh, you want it? You want to get into it? It is on now, baby. But the psalmist says, I'm just going to ignore them. And I'm going to meditate on your precepts. Again, going back to, to Brother Roy. And all the hateful and despicable things that those men said about him. And Roy never turned and said anything. They even let him hit him and smack him and slap him. And he would go back and his comfort was, I shall meditate on your precepts. I will meditate on your precepts. Their unjust treatment of me is not going to move or change me. Let me tell you something, beloved. God's humbling of the proud is a necessary part of their salvation. You understand that? Listen to me. They're either going to become your brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Or God is going to abandon them to his judgment. Those are the only two options. There's not a middle ground. And so God is humbling the proud as a necessary part of their salvation. Spurgeon said, he would study the law of God and not the law of retaliation. The proud are not worth a thought. The worst injury they can do us is take us away from our devotions. Mm. The worst thing they can do to me, you know, God... Let me tell you something. They're arrogant. God, they're all over me. I, I, I can't stand it, God. God, I, I, I need you to come and to deal with I, I need you to take these guys out. What, what am I doing? Who have I given control to? Well, it's not to God. I've given control to those that are persecuting me. I've given control to those that are coming against me. Spurgeon said that's the very worst thing that they can do is take us away from our devotion to God. Let us baffle them by keeping all the closer to our God when they are most malicious in their onslaughts. 
Verse 79. What he's saying here is, may those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. Once again, he, he's doing the same thing that, that, that Paul is doing in several of his letters. Let me ask all of us a question. Think about the last trial that you went through. Okay, you got it in your mind? Would we be able to say to God, may those who fear you turn to me and watch how you and I walk through this trial together? That's what he's asking. He's saying, God, let others see in my life you so clearly that when they're going through a rough patch, that they'll remember how you sustained me. Verse 80. Now the rubber's hitting the road. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I will not be ashamed. In other words, oh God, when I walk out the door in the morning, help me to be committed to living my life in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And as I'm facing temptations, as I'm facing these hateful and despicable and untrue words of these people, then, Lord, let me walk in a way that never disappoints you. Do you understand? Y'all understand where the concept of booting a computer comes from? You know what it means? On every bootable media, there is a part on track zero, sector zero, okay, that tells the computer what to do. Do you understand your computer doesn't know how to read a disk drive? It has no clue how to do that, okay? And so what it does is when it starts, there's little code that says go over to this place, And look at track zero, sector zero, and there you're going to find everything you need to know to keep going in this process. And so every time you boot your computer, you do something impossible. It pulls itself up by its own bootstraps. Okay? I can lift about 200 pounds. So theoretically, I should be able to reach down and pull my feet up off the ground and hold myself. Right? Okay? And so that's what we get ourselves into a mess about. See, we think we can do this. We think, I got this. I know how to do this. And what the psalmist is saying is, may my heart be blameless in your statutes. May my heart be in your word, O God, because I know that if I get my heart out of your word, then I am not going to have a chance. See, I live in a deceitful world. Remember the call of Isaiah? Oh, woe is me, for I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and we could say the father of unclean lips is after us. God, create within me. May my heart be blameless in your statutes. How's God going to answer that prayer? Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, I love this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that yearns after God. We need to pray that God's steadfast love will comfort and encourage us and that we remain focused on God's Word in the midst of our trials, that our lives and our faithfulness would strengthen God's people and we would not veer from obeying God's Word but rather be blameless in all things. How do we do it? Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing. Why don't I just ask you to stop breathing? I mean, 
There are things in all of our lives that cause us anxiety. Paul says the solution to this whole problem is to be anxious for nothing. Well, Pastor Larry, how you do it? In everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. God, I don't understand this trial that I'm going through right now. I don't understand why that person is talking smack against me. I don't understand why all of this is going on. But God, I know that your word says that it was ordained for me before I was even formed. This is the way it's supposed to be at this moment. And so God, against every fiber in my being, I thank you for this experience because I know that you are going to walk with me through it. You are going to sustain me. You're going to carry me through. And you are going to receive glory. That's how you pray verse 6, beloved. Let your request be made known to God. And then look at what God's going to do. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus. And that, beloved, is our heart in the Word of God.